Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and we're finally back in the office after like half a year. Luckily our office is still here, not burnt down or full of contagion, so great news. Now recently one of our fans commented in one of our videos and asked us to do a video about the top flagships in Star Wars. We thought that was a great idea, so that's what we're going to be doing today, starting off with the pre-Republic period ranging all the way to the First Order Resistance War. The Rakan Infinite Empire was perhaps one of the greatest threats to peace and freedom in galactic history. Now the problem for us is their invasion and subjugation of the galaxy happened 26,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, so there isn't that much information on details about their ships and what kind of weapons and schematics they had. However, we do know that the Rakatans used the force-powered superweapon factory known as the Star Forge, which consumes entire star systems for raw materials, which is then used to mass-produce ships and weapons. The Rakatan Navy was completely made up of a class of ships known just as Rakatan ships by modern scholars. It's said that their design was originally created by the advanced Qua, who had uplifted the primitive Rakatans in the first place. The Rakatan ships had two large energy-based weapons that could fire from between the forks of the two prongs on the ship. There was also a central pod from which the command crew operated the ship using the dark side of the force. The most fearsome Rakatan ship in the Rakatan Infinite Empire would be the Ravager, flagship of the Praetor Skalnas. Skalnas, who was ruthless even by Rakatan standards, would lead the invasion on the Tython system against the ancient Jedi Order. Legends say it was the Ravager which also led a fleet of Rakatan ships in the glassing of Tatooine, which prior to this had been a jungle planet. Now we'll be skipping forward to 5,000 years before the Battle of Yavin to the Great Hyperspace War, the first true conflict between the Sith Empire and the Jedi-backed Old Republic. Naga Shadow had consolidated the Sith power structure after defeating rival Sith leader Ludo Kresh and set his eyes on the Old Republic's territory. At the head of his fleet was the terrifying Corsair, a Durfin-class battleship. At 215 meters long with 12 massive thrusters and a Class IV hyperdrive, it was considered state-of-the-art at the time. Now, in the Galactic Imperial period, it probably would have been considered a frigate. A small frigate. The Corsair's main weapons consisted of heavy concussion missile batteries and point defense laser cannons. Like most ships at the time, there were no deflector shields on board. They mainly relied on armor for defense. But at the time, the ancient Sith also possessed all sorts of ancient force magics that would be lost during the following Jedi and Sith conflicts. The Corsair had this one special Sith-powered weapon that was capable of destroying entire stars using the dark side of the Force, making this vessel one of the most terrifying in the galaxy. The Sith fleet was more or less unstoppable with the Corsair at its head, especially during the early Sith offensives into Republic space, but eventually the Republic would regroup during the Battle of Coruscant, forcing the Sith to retreat back towards Sith space. Nagao Shadow's entire fleet would eventually be rounded up and destroyed by the Old Republic Navy. The Corsair alone survived the series of battles with the Old Republic that eventually led to the downfall of the Sith Empire. Naga Shadow would ultimately crash the Corsair into the hidden moon of Yavin 4. He would build a temple around his crashed ship and start a cult with the local Masaski as his followers. Roughly a thousand years later, the fallen Jedi Exar Kun would rediscover the Corsair on Yavin 4 and unearth the ship, and once again it would see action during the Great Sith War as the flagship of the Sith until it was finally destroyed when it imploded a star in the Kron Cluster, taking out a massive Republic Jedi fleet with a supernova. Just a few decades later, in 3963 BBY, the Old Republic would commission the Interdictor-class battlecruiser. And at 600 meters, these capital ships became the backbone of the Old Republic Navy. They were equipped with five medium turbo laser batteries, six point defense light laser batteries, three tractor beams, and most importantly, four gravity wells. The gravity well projectors on these ships could pull enemy ships out of hyperspace and then keep them in real space so that they couldn't escape. During the Mandalorian Wars, the Interdictor-class cruiser would see action against the Mandalorian fleet, and when Revan's Jedi joined the battle, many of these ships would fall beneath his command. After Revan betrayed the Republic and joined the Sith Emperor Vitiate's cause, Revan would rediscover the ancient Rakatan Starforge and use it to replicate hundreds of copies of an Interdictor-class cruiser known as the Leviathan. 
Revan would return to the Republic at the head of this massive Leviathan clone fleet and rain down destruction on Republic worlds. Revan would eventually be captured by the Jedi Order, and so his apprentice Darth Malak would take control of his flagship, the Leviathan. Malak would later on use the ship to bombard the populated Eusebinopolis Taurus into ruins. The massive Eternal flagship was at the head of the Eternal fleet. A large group of alien battle cruisers of unknown design that were operated by sentient droids and were far more advanced than any other ship design known to the galaxy. Eternal Fleet battle cruisers not only possess massive amounts of firepower and very fast sublight speed, they also had cloaking technology. It was said that the Eternal Fleet was responsible for wiping out all sentient life in wild space. The Eternal Fleet would eventually be found on the world of Zakul by the Sith Emperor Vitiate in his new form of Valkorion. In 3647 BBY, the Eternal Fleet would be brought back to operation under the control of the Eternal Throne. With the Eternal Flagship at its head, the massive naval force was able to defeat both the Sith Empire and Galactic Republic at the same time. Prince Arkin, son of Valkorion, would command the Eternal Flagship, and unlike the rest of the Eternal Fleet, the Flagship was operated by the most skilled and loyal humans of the Eternal Empire. The Eternal Flagship, along with the rest of the Eternal Fleet, would ultimately meet its demise at the hands of the Gravestone, an enormous alien ship equipped with Omni Cannons that allowed it to destroy entire portions of the Eternal Fleet at the same time. Commissioned by the Separatist Alliance in complete secrecy, the Malevolence was a 4,845 meter long super weapon that was built around a pair of dual Mega Ion Cannons, which had such a wide firing arc that they were capable of disabling entire fleets of ships at once. The Malevolence would then use its 500 turbo lasers to destroy the powered down vessels. During the earlier years of the Clone Wars, General Grievous was able to use this massive ship to take out entire Republic armadas before they were even able to report what was going on. The Malevolence was eventually cornered by a combined Republic fleet led by Anakin Skywalker. The Jedi found a central weakness to the Malevolence's design. Although it had hundreds of turbo lasers, the ship only had five point defense weapons and a small complement of short range vulture fighters. Using a small fighter squadron of Y Wings, Anakin was able to take out the Malevolence's ion cannons and then pursued the ship with a fleet of Venators and slowly chipped away at the massive ship's shields and armor. The Malevolence, however, could absorb a massive amount of punishment, and so the Jedi came up with a plan to sabotage the hyperdrive on the ship, causing it to fly directly into a moon. The Imperial-class Star Destroyer served as the backbone of the Galactic Empire Navy, and although there are many famous individual vessels, none were wielded more proficiently than the Chimera, under the command of Grand Admiral Thrawn. The 1600-meter vessel was designed as a battleship with a heavy focus on firepower, provided by 60 heavy turbolaser batteries. The Chimera would serve as the flagship of both the 96th Task Force and also the 7th Fleet, and quell rebellions all across the Outer Rim and later on destroy a huge portion of the Rebel Fleet during the Battle of Atalon, and again during the defense of Lothal. Ultimately, Thrawn would be defeated by heavily plot-armored rebels wielding magical space whales. The Chimera would be forcibly pulled into the Unknown Region, where it most likely still remains intact today. In Legends, the Chimera would suffer a much happier fate and serve as Thrawn's flagship during the post-Imperial Era, and later be transferred to Thrawn's protege, Grand Admiral Pelion of the Imperial Remnant. The Chimera would serve valiantly against the extra-galactic Yuzang Vong invaders and even participated in the Second Galactic Civil War. The Profundity was a modified MC-75 Star Cruiser, which served as the flagship for the Alliance fleet in the earlier years of the Rebellion. Like many Mon Calamari ships, the Profundity originally was a Mon Calamari civic building in one of their homeworld's many underwater cities. The Profundity was originally Nystolium City's governance tower, and it escaped the Imperial takeover of Mon Calamari in the very first years of the Empire. The Profundity was the first ship in the Mon Calamari Exodus fleet to be converted into a warship, and at 1,204 meters long, it was the only ship that the Rebels possessed at the time that could stand up against the might of an Imperial-class Star Destroyer. The Profundity would play a crucial part in the Rebel raid on Scarif to steal plans for the Death Star, but ultimately would be destroyed by Darth Vader's own flagship, the Devastator. The Dawn of Tranquility was the last MC-85 cruiser to be built by the New Republic after the signing of the Galactic Concordance and Demilitarization Act. 
The MC-85 cruiser would eventually be renamed the Radis after Admiral Radis, commander of the Profundity, the last ship we talked about. The Radis would eventually be phased out by the new Republic Navy because of demilitarization and be bought by the resistance movement and fall under the command of the legendary rebel admiral, Gal Akbar. Like many ships of the era, the Radis was automated to decrease the amount of crew members needed to operate the ship. During the evacuation of Dakar, the Radis suffered a major blow after the bridge was destroyed by a proton torpedo, which took out most of the command crew. Admiral Aldo, a career politician, took command of the ship and ultimately used it as a giant missile in hyperspace, rammed it into the First Order Armada, chasing the resistance, taking out a massive amount of First Order ships. The Supremacy is easily the largest ship on our list at 60 kilometers in wingspan. The Mega-class Star Dreadnought fits the First Order's needs as not only a flagship of their entire fleet, but also as the moving capital for their entire faction. Exiled in the unknown region, the First Order was pretty optimistic about their chances of retaking Republic space from the New Republic. The Supremacy, therefore, was built with several training facilities on board, including no less than eight docks that could outfit full-size research and class Star Destroyers, which were around 3,000 meters in length. The Supremacy was essentially a moving battle station, military academy, and city, all wrapped into one package. 2.2 million First Order personnel would call the ship home, along with entire legions of stormtroopers and multiple wings of starfighters. The Dreadnought, unfortunately, would meet its end after the last ship on our list, the Radis, slammed into it at hyperspace speeds. The Supremacy would be sheared in half and deemed too damaged to be repaired, and ultimately scuttled by the First Order. So there you have it, guys. Nine very impressive flagships for various reasons. Let me know in the comments section below what you think about them, and if I've missed any of your favorite flagships, I'm sure I have. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.